Hello again, Physics 30s. In today's lesson, we are going to begin the last unit of study in Physics 30 on nuclear physics. And more specifically in this lesson, we're going to talk a little bit about what a nuclear reaction is, how to write nuclear equations, and then introduce a couple more important physics principles, those dealing with conservation of nucleons and conservation of mass energy. Learning outcomes are to one, use the law of conservation of charge and mass number to predict the particles emitted by a nucleus, and two, relate qualitatively and quantitatively the mass defect of the nucleus to the energy released in nuclear reactions using Einstein's concept of mass energy equivalence. Okay, so the focus of this unit of study is going to be on, in nuclear physics, is on the nucleus. What we know is that the nucleus is composed of nucleons. Nucleons can be either protons or neutrons. In fact, when you count the number of nucleons in a nucleus, it would be the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Our atomic number which for just now, I'm gonna use the variable capital Z to represent, uh, is going to indicate the number of protons in a particular nucleus. I also said, or charge. So for focusing just on the nucleus and not, about, not focusing on the outer electrons, then the charge of our nucleus would be dependent completely on the number of protons within the nucleus. For example, I think uh, lithium has an atomic number of three, which means that it has three protons and it would the nucleus would have a charge of plus three. Of course, the atom as a whole is neutral when you count for the three electrons, but again, we're just focusing on the nucleus here. The neutron number will represent with a capital N and obviously, this is going to be the number of neutrons. And your atomic mass number would be equal to the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we'll represent that with a capital A. I believe this notation that we're going to use as we write down nuclear equations shortly is called a nuclear notation. So in the nuclear notation, you have three parts. You have like your element, which I'm representing with uh, an X. And then to the left of the element symbol, you then have uh, two quantities. So you have Z, which is the number of protons associated with that element or the atomic number. And then you have A, which would be the combined number of nucleons for that element. So protons plus neutrons. So I just want to give a couple of examples of uh, some really important some very important uh, particles that we're going to look at in this unit here. Okay, so let's look at a proton. So what would a proton be? Okay, so we can write it in one of two ways. We can write down a proton uh, with the element symbol, a lowercase p. Now, to the left of the symbol, we have to identify the atomic number and the atomic mass number. Okay, so for a proton, uh, how many protons do you have? That's the atomic number. Well, that would just be one. And the mass number would be the number of protons plus neutrons well it's just a proton therefore a proton would simply also have would simply have uh one for an atomic number uh you could also write it like this though well which element has only one proton in it well it's hydrogen so we could just write down h I'm going to write the ones down differently because these ones look kind of funky here. So we could write down hydrogen is 1, 1, H. Okay, so that's one particle. Well, how about a neutron? Okay, a neutron we can use the element symbol, a lowercase n for. 
Okay, and a neutron, what's your atomic number, which is your number of protons of your charge? Well, neutron has no charge, has no protons, so that'd be zero. What about the number of the, the mass number? The mass number would be protons plus neutrons. Well, you just have one neutron, so that would just simply be a one. How about an alpha particle? Okay, a couple of ways you can write this. Uh, one, we could choose the element symbol, the Greek letter for alpha. Now, if you'll recall, an alpha particle is the helium nucleus, except it's just missing its outer electrons. So what's the atomic number for helium? Well, it's the second element, so we'd have two protons for that, so you'd write down two. And then what's the atomic mass number? Well, that'd be protons plus neutrons. So if we look at the actual periodic table, and we are going to need to make reference to a periodic table quite a bit throughout this lesson, uh, helium has an atomic... Uh, an atomic mass number that is four. So that means that your combined number of nucleons and protons is four. So protons and neutrons is four. Therefore, we'd have four to alpha. Or we can also write it like this, okay? Because an alpha particle is the helium nucleus. And in the helium nucleus, you have two protons, but you also have two neutrons giving you an atomic mass number of four. Okay, now one more, we'll look at the electron. Okay, an electron, we can use the symbol E to represent. Now this one's a little bit trickier. Okay, I said there's two things the atomic number can represent. It can represent the number of protons or it can represent your electrical charge. Well, we know for an electron, the electrical charge is negative one. I guess a negative one right here would just indicate a deficiency maybe of one proton, but we can. it's better to actually think of the bottom line here in terms of charge. Okay, so you'd have negative one for your charge, and then the top value would be the number of nucleons. Well, an electron isn't classified as a nucleon, so it would just be zero, negative one E. Or sometimes we'll refer to an electron as being a beta particle. So I can take the Greek letter beta, uh, and then I can just write down the same thing for my uh, charge number or charge value and also my nucleon number. Okay, so those are our four big subatomic particles, a proton, a neutron, an alpha particle, and an electron. And that's how we'd write it in that nuclear notation that I've just identified. Isotopes, we'll talk a lot about isotopes in this unit are atoms that have the same number of protons, but a different number of neutrons. Okay, so let's give a few examples of this. Okay, so we have carbon-12, and, and I'm not sure like what the name of this notation is again. I think it's something along the lines of like uh, isotope notation. And the way the isotope notation works is you write down the element name and then a hyphen. And after the hyphen, this number, the 12, indicates your number of nucleons. Again, nucleons is protons plus your neutrons. So the way we'd write down carbon-12 would be, okay, well, carbon has an atomic number of six, which means it has six protons. And then the 12 means the combined number of protons and neutrons. Carbon-13 would... Well, it's still carbon, so it has the same atomic number, so six protons, except 13 means that uh, you have a different number of nucleons. So now you have 13. So how many neutrons would you have on these? Well, to figure out the number of neutrons, you just take the top number and subtract the bottom number. So how many neutrons in this first one? 12 minus six would be six. How about this one? How many neutrons are in here? If you have uh, 13 nucleons, and six of those are protons, the number of neutrons you would have would be 13 minus six, which is seven. Or carbon-14. Carbon-14 would still be carbon, therefore an atomic number of six, except you'd have 14 nucleons. So how many neutrons in this one? You would have 14 minus six, which is eight. 
Okay, so these are all isotopes of carbon. So an isotope of an element means that it's the same element in terms of its atomic number and number of protons. So we're all talking about carbon here, except they're isotopes of carbon because they have varying numbers of uh, neutrons. So carbon-12 has six neutrons, carbon-13 has seven neutrons, and carbon-14 has eight neutrons. Now, we're going to be interested in writing a nuclear equation. There's going to be a little bit of a similarity in, uh, compared to chemistry. In chemistry, we, we'd write down chemical equations. And then in the nuclear physics unit, we're going to, I'm going to introduce you now to something called a nuclear equation. Nuclear equations are used to represent nuclear interactions. Okay, so there's a really big difference between a chemical equation and a nuclear equation, so or a nuclear reaction. So I'll just kind of distinguish them here. So if you look at a chemical reaction, okay, and I'll just pick I'll pick like one example. So let's say that we have the combustion of uh, propane. Okay, so propane is C3H8, and then combustion means we're going to react it with oxygen, and then we're going to produce carbon dioxide, and we're also going to produce some water vapor. Now, the key thing with a chemical reaction is in a chemical reaction, the principle that you're looking in terms of balancing is conservation of mass. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to balance the equation here, but the point is uh, in a chemical reaction, you're going to have, you need to have the same number of carbons on one side of the equation. Okay. Because you're, you're balancing your mass of carbon. You also need to have the same number of hydrogens. Okay, so you've got a few hydrogens here. And then you also need to have the same number of oxygen. So to balance a chemical reaction, you do need to make sure that you have the same number of atoms, yeah, of each element on each side of the equation. And then it's balanced because it's all about conservation of mass. Now, a nuclear reaction is a little bit different. Well, actually, not a little bit different, quite a bit different. So in a nuclear reaction, let's say we took element X and reacted it with element Y. In a nuclear reaction, you're actually going to change the nucleus. So you're not going to have the same element on both sides of the equation. So you're actually going to make a completely different type of atom. So if we reacted X and Y together, we would actually get maybe Z, like something, something completely different. Okay. So we're not balancing number of atoms on each side of the equation. We're going to have a couple of other quantities that we're going to try to balance. The example I gave here, as I said, dis disintegration or transmutation of a nucleus, which just means we're going to completely change which nucleus we're looking at. This will make more sense, I believe, when we actually go through a few examples. But we're going to get uh, different types of atoms on the products and react inside of the equation. Okay, now here's some rules in writing nuclear equations. One. The original isotopes are what we refer to as the parent isotopes. So the parent isotopes would just be your reactants. Okay, it's what you're starting with. The final isotope or isotopes are what we refer to as daughter isotopes. So those would be my products in a nuclear equation. When you write a nuclear equation, there are two quantities that need to be conserved. One is electrical charge, so conservation of charge, and two is the number of nucleons. Okay, so let's spell out the actual physics principles. Uh, physics principles. Okay, so electrical charge would be conservation of charge. Now, if we look at an actual uh, isotope in nuclear notations, we had that format that was A, 
Z, X. Which of these three uh, letters represents the charge? Well, it's, it's the Z, because it tells you the number of protons or the electrical charge for your nucleus. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to, when we write down the equation, we're gonna have to make sure that the bottom lines are going to be balanced. Okay, the other thing we need to make sure is that the number of nucleons are conserved. So that's gonna to lead to another physics principle on the formula sheet. So we have conservation, in fact, we're gonna like, we're gonna introduce both uh, the last two physics principles today. So we have conservation of nucleons. Okay, what represents the nucleons in the nuclear equation? Well, it's that top number, okay? So it's gonna be the top line that we're gonna to have to make sure is balanced. Okay, so let's go here. So as example, when boron 10 captures a neutron, a new element and an alpha particle are produced. A, write a nuclear equation for this interaction and B, identify the missing daughter isotope. All right. So th this, this will make it a bit more clear in terms of how you write one of these equations. Okay, so let's do A first. Okay, so first of all, boron 10. Boron, and again, we need to make reference to our periodic table. Boron has an element symbol that is a capital B. Now, we need to write two things, the bottom number and the top number. The bottom number is the number of protons in boron or the atomic number. If you look at your periodic table, the atomic number of boron is five. Okay, so boron, the, nucle the nucleus boron has five protons in it. Now, it directly tells me up here what the nucleon number is, because the number that follows this hyphen in the uh, isotope notation is, in, is the combined number of protons and neutrons. That's going to be a 10. Okay, it says when boron 10 captures a neutron, well, we already identified what a neutron is. So a neutron, we'll use the element symbol N, and a neutron has zero protons or charge, and it has one nucleon, which is just the single neutron on its own. Okay, these are gonna interact and these are going to produce an alpha particle. So an alpha particle is the helium nucleus. And again, helium has an atomic number of two, which means it has two protons. And helium has an atomic mass number that is four. The way to get the mass number is I would just look at the molar mass that's written on the periodic table and then just round it either to the, to the nearest whole number, either up or down. And that's the more common isotope of the of the, the atom you're looking at. Although oftentimes we're told what isotope we're dealing with, in which case we don't have to worry about the rounding. Okay, anyways, helium has an atomic mass number of four. So it has two protons and it has two neutrons. Now, what we need to do is we need to figure out what is the missing element. Okay, so the missing element is gonna have a few parts here. So first of all, I'm gonna use X to just represent the fact I don't know what this uh, element actually is. Actually, let's do it like this. Okay, so we got three parts we gotta worry about. Uh, let's, we need to worry about the bottom number. We need to figure out what the top number is. And we also need to figure out what the element symbol is. Okay, now here's how you do this. It's actually easier to balance a nuclear equation than it is to balance a chemical equation. Okay, so all we need to do is we need to apply conservation of charge and conservation of nucleons. So let's do conservation of charge first. So conservation of charge, means we need to make sure that the numbers on the bottom before and after the reaction are balanced. So we're looking at the bottom line here. Okay, so what I mean by this is if we take the sum of the, 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 char the charge numbers for the reactants, so if we went five plus zero, that needs to be equal to 
the same combined number on the product side. So that'd have to be two plus, plus some kind of question mark. So I need to make sure that the bottom number, when I take the, the sum of the bottom numbers, it has uh, for the reactants, it needs to be equal to the sum of the bottom numbers for the products. Okay, so the sum of the bottom numbers for the reactants would be five plus zero, which is five. Therefore, two plus what's gonna be five? Well, obviously it's three, okay? So that's gonna be a three here. Now, right away, we can figure out what the actual element is, because if you look at the periodic table, what element has an atomic number that is three? Well, that would be lithium. Okay. So we've got lithium. Okay, now I also need to make sure the top line is balanced. So we're gonna look at conservation of nucleons. So we're going to do the same thing, except now to the top line. Okay, so for the top line, we need to take the sum of the nucleons for the reactants. So that'd be 10 plus 11, so 10 plus 1, which is 11. And then that needs to be equal to the sum of the nucleons for the products. So that 10 plus 1 needs to be equal to 4 plus whatever the question mark is. Okay, so the sum of the nucleon, uh, the nucleon number for the reactants would be 11. So four plus what is 11? Well, that'd be seven. So that's my missing, that's my complete nuclear equation. I'm basically just uh, using conservation of charge and conservation of nucleons to, first of all, uh, identify the conservation of charge to figure out the charge or the atomic number for the missing daughter isotope and then conservation of nucleons to figure out what the nucleon number is and then we can figure out the element from the uh from the, the atomic number okay and then b says well what's the actual daughter isotope it just wants us to write it down in that uh, isotope notation okay so the daughter isotope is lithium And then after the hyphen, we write down the nucleon number. So the daughter ice took the lithium seven. Now, again, I just want to point out before we move on uh, that in a nuclear reaction, again, we're not balancing number of atoms on each side. That's a chemical reaction. So again, we're getting completely different elements here. So I've reacted boron with a neutron together. I end up getting helium and lithium. So completely different atoms. And that's the significance of a nuclear reaction is that in a nuclear reaction, you're actually producing new atoms entirely, as opposed to just balancing the number of atoms like you would do for a chemical reaction. Okay, let's keep going. We're going to talk about an atomic mass unit, which we're going to represent with a lowercase u. An atomic mass unit is defined as exactly one twelfth the mass of carbon 12. What's the mass of one twelfth of carbon 12? Well, one atomic mass unit would be 1.660540 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Now you do have this value on your formula sheet, albeit it just rounded to three significant digits. So one atomic mass unit is going to be equal to 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. Okay, so it is on the uh, formula sheet. Now you might be wondering why am I defining this unit? Well, it, it's kind of like the similar reasoning for why we defined an electron volt. So you'll recall that like one electron volt is 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. An electron volt is a useful unit when we're talking about really small amounts of energy. Okay, so we're dealing with small amounts of energy. It's more convenient to express energy in electron volts than joules because if we express in joules, we'd always have to write down times 10 to the negative whatever for joules. Same thing for the reasoning for identifying an atomic mass unit. It's just a more convenient unit for what we're about to deal with because we're going to deal with uh, really, really tiny masses. So as opposed to having to always like write down the 10 to the negative, whatever, we can define 
mass of our subatomic particles in terms of an atomic mass unit. One proton has a mass of 1.007276 atomic mass units. So we know that the mass of a proton to three significant digits is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. So it's a little bit above what an atomic mass unit is. One neutron, it turns out that they actually have a, a small difference in their masses. So we've so far in the course, we've identified a proton and a neutron as having an identical mass, both of 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27. But if we break it down a little bit more, it turns out a neutron has a slightly larger mass than a proton. The three significant digits for kilograms, we don't notice any difference, but if you write in atomic mass units, there is a small difference. We'll talk about later on why there is that difference. Okay, now we're going to get into uh, a concept that deals with something called mass defect, which is delta M. Okay, let's set up the context of this problem. Okay, when scientists took the theoretical mass of helium and compared it to its actual mass, they found a mass defect. Okay, here's what I mean by this. So let's say I said to you, figure out what the theoretical mass of helium-4 is. So helium-4, well, that's just an alpha particle. So that would be uh, 4, 2, He. For helium-4, we would have two protons. And we would have two neutrons. Now, if I wanted to figure out the mass of helium-4, what I would do is I would go, the mass of helium-4 would be equal to two protons multiplied by the mass of a proton, which would be 1.007276 atomic mass units, plus you have two neutrons, so the two times the mass of a neutron, so one point zero zero eight six six five atomic mass units okay so we'll call that mt which will be like the theoretical mass so theoretically this is how i should calculate it and if i do calculate it so two times one point zero zero seven two seven six plus one times one point zero zero eight six six five i would get a value that is four point zero three one eight eight two atomic mass units okay so that's what the mass of helium-4 should theoretically be it turns out though that when scientists actually determine the mass of helium-4 they found that the actual mass is a little bit smaller so maybe we'll call the actual mass ma so MA, I'm just going to make up a fake number here. Let's make it really easy. Let's say when they actually found the mass of helium, there was the mass was only four atomic mass units. So the actual mass is a little bit smaller than what it's supposed to be theoretically. Okay. The difference between these two is what we refer to as a mass defect. So if you take your theoretical mass and subtract what the actual mass is, you get a mass defect. So in this case, the mass defect would be like really, really small. So the mass defect here, again, I'm just making up these numbers. So this would be delta M for helium would be equal to 0 0.031882 atomic mass units. Okay, so you've got a small mass defect. Now, this mass defect is not due to like experimental error. It's not like the scientists like figure out the mass of actual mass of helium. There's just error, and that's what 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 accounts for the small mass defect. There's something else going on here. So the, the question really is, why is the actual mass smaller? So theoretically, that should be the mass, the mass of two protons plus two neutrons. But when we actually figure out the mass, uh, the actual mass, it's smaller. And I have something called a mass defect. Okay, so there's, there's a small amount of mass that's not properly being accounted for. Okay, this is going to lead to something called binding energy, which you're going to represent with delta E. Okay, now I just want to take a, a step back for a moment. So 
when talking about that transition from classical to modern physics, I identified like, uh, I think there were about three major problems that physicists had in terms of things they could not explain. So one, they could not explain the black body radiation curve. Two, they could not explain in the photoelectric effect why increasing light intensity increases the current, but not the speed of your electrons. And three, they didn't really understand why when you excite a gas and then you direct the light from that gas through diffraction gradient or prism, why you get those distinct bright lines. Well, we addressed those three problems back in the modern physics unit by talking, but, but by looking at a more expanded model of the atom. We needed, we needed the Bohr model of the atom to explain two of those three. We need the, pho the photon model to explain the photoelectric effect. The other thing they could not explain is this. You look at a nucleus, even like a, a helium nucleus. So what does a helium nucleus have? Well, it would have two protons. And it would have two neutrons. These two protons, they want to repel like crazy. Like they're really, really close to each other. Hey, if you look at Coulomb's law, so Coulomb's law tells us the magnitude of the electrostatic force between those two charges would be K times Q1, Q2 over R squared. If the distance between them is small, the electrostatic force should be huge. So there's be a huge amount of force between these two protons that's trying to make that atom explode. Okay, those things like to, to rip, the, to push each other apart. Now, obviously that doesn't happen. So th this is another one of these like problems that baffled physicists. Like why doesn't the atom explode if this electrostatic repulsion tries to push the protons apart? Okay, so if they're not going to repel, what that means is there needs to be a lot of energy that can hold them together. We're going to call this energy required to hold those protons in place to overcome that repulsion, binding energy. So we want to bind or hold the nucleus together and offset that electrostatic repulsion. It turns out this binding energy is equal to the mass defect. And immediately, th th this doesn't seem to make any sense because you're like, well, wait a second. Ha energy is in joules, and then mass is either in atomic mass units or kilograms. They can't directly be equal to each other. Well, they have an equivalence. Now, we're once again going to go back to another phase, famous scientist, Albert Einstein. So again, we talked about him a little bit back in the modern physics unit as, as he was being someone who really liked Max Planck's photon model of the atom, and he used it to explain the photoelectric effect. But he's much more famously known for his mass energy equivalence theory. In fact, when people probably just randomly, like people who don't know a lot about physics, just randomly think about a physics equation, I suspect they come up with the equation e equals mc squared. Okay, we're going to write a little bit differently here. We're going to write down delta E is equal to delta MC squared. Okay, so here's how this works. If I go back to this equation, and let's look at this mass defect. We have like this right here. This small little amount of money, or not money, small little amount of mass. If we take that mass and we plug it in here for delta M, and we multiply by C squared. C squared is kind of like a conversion factor. It lets you go from mass to energy and vice versa. If you take that mass defect and multiply by C squared, it gives you the exact amount of binding energy needed to hold that nucleus together. So you might be wondering, well, why is there a mass defect? Well, the reason there's a mass defect is because you need some energy to hold the nucleus together. Okay, because the nucleus wants to, to blow up, it wants to repel. So where does that energy, so we need delta E to hold it together. So where do we get that delta E from? Well, we steal a little bit of the mass. Okay, we take away some of the delta M. And if you take that delta M, take away a little bit of the mass and convert it to energy, it does give us our binding energy that does hold the nucleus together. Okay, so kind of funky. Uh, there is like, I believe, a mathematical proof for this. Uh, I, I think it deals with, uh, I want to say special relative, relativity from Einstein. It might be general relativity. It's one of those two those two principles, which if you take university physics, you study them in more detail. For the time being, you just need to, you just need to take my word for this. 
Okay, so there's a couple of ways to like think about the binding energy. So the binding energy could be like the amount of energy required to overcome repulsion and just hold the nucleus together. It can also be defined as like how much energy would be required to take a nucleon and remove it from the nucleus. So they're just the same amount. They're just two different ways of viewing the, the same quantity. And this leads us to our final physics principle on our uh, formula sheet, conservation of mass energy. It turns out that mass and energy are actually aspects of one law since mass and energy are interconvertible, which means that you can take mass and you can turn it into energy and you can take energy and you can turn it into mass. Now I should point out that is not easy to do. Okay. Like, it's not like you can just take an apple and then like just snap your fingers and make it turn into pure energy. Okay? It's not going to happen. Okay. It is possible to take really tiny subatomic particles and convert them into energy, but even that is really, really hard to do. Okay. So we can go between the two. It's just, a, it's just a tough process to actually do it. Now we're going to talk more about this later on. Um, this allows us to imagine the, like the following two scenarios. So it allows us to imagine the creation of particles from radiant or kinetic energy. So what this means is that, uh, we can take energy and when I say radiant energy, I mean like photon energy. This could be like a gamma ray, this could be like gamma ray energy, and we can actually create mass. Now, not big mass. I'm talking about like the small subatomic particles we can, uh, we can look at, but it is possible to take energy and turn it into mass. Or we can take particles and we can annihilate them so they can actually give us energy. So that's the reverse process. That would be, that would be where we have particles M and we can turn it into delta E. Now we're going to talk more about the how to do this a little bit later on in the unit. But for the time being, just be aware there are situations where you can turn energy to mass and mass back into energy. Okay, let's give an example of this by looking at the energy equivalent of an electron. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the mass of an electron and let's just like hypothetically ask ourselves, okay, if I could take an electron and I could turn it into pure energy, how much pure energy would that electron be? Okay, so let's go through the calculation. So we have E is equal to MC squared. Now, if I plug some numbers in for an electron, now I'm, I'm adding a lot more significant digits than uh, I, I would normally have. So uh, usually we just go three significant digits for the mass of an electron and the speed of light, but let's just expand it a bit more. So we'll say that E is equal to the mass of an electron, 9.109383 times 10 to the negative 31 multiplied by the speed of light, I believe in a vacuum or air. So 2.997925 times 10 to the eight meters per second, all squared. I'm not sure if that value is air or in a vacuum, but it doesn't really matter here. Okay, now if we calculate that, so look at the units here. So this would give me kilograms times meter squared per second squared. Now that's a joule. So if we calculate the energy in joules, it would give me an energy of 8.5. 187107 times 10 to the negative 14 joules. However, it's more convenient to write energy in terms of uh, uh, electron volts compared to joules. We're talking about small amount of energy. So we're going to immediately convert it into electron volts. Okay, so I know in one electron volt, again, just more significant digits than I need, 1.602177 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And instead of converting it into electron volts, we're going to convert it into mega electron volts. Uh, so if we turn this into one mega electron volts, mega is 10 to the six. So one mega electron volts would be instead of 10 to the negative 19, it would be 10 to the negative 13. Okay. So we're going to con convert this from joules into mega electron volts. Okay, so if we could take an electron, its mass, and turn it into energy, it would be equivalent to an energy amount that's 0 0.511 mega electron volts. 
Now, the formula sheet also writes down the mass of an electron in a really odd manner. If you look at your formula sheet, there's, I believe there's actually, uh, uh, if you go to the particles section and then go down where it says first generation fermions and you look at an electron, it also gives the mass in terms of some really funky units. Okay, so I'm going to show you where we get these funky units now. Okay, so let's take the mass of an electron and let's re or, or let's try to calculate the mass equivalent of an electron. So we have in terms of its energy. So if m is equal to e over c squared, so manipulate the equation equals mc squared for m. Now, if I plug that in, you're going to get a value that is. Don't, we're not going to plug in the value for the speed of light squared because if I did that, that would convert it back into mass units. You're going to get a number that looks like 0.511 mega electron volts per C squared. Okay, and that's a value you see in the formula sheet for an electron under first generation fermion. So the way to interpret this is it's basically saying, okay, what's the mass of an electron? Well, the mass this, this is the mass of an electron in terms of its energy. So the mass of an electron, if you wrote it in terms of its energy equivalent, would be... 0.511 mega electron volts okay so if i could take an electron and i could convert it into pure energy it would have energy that's 0.511 uh, mega electron volts and this is just a weird way of writing down the uh, mass of an electron it writes on the mass of an electron in terms of uh, its equivalent energy as opposed to just its regular old mass in kilograms up here so that's the way to interpret that okay so it's just telling you uh what the mass of an electron is in terms of the energy you could potentially convert it into all right let's finish this lesson off by doing an example here so it says the mass of one nucleus of potassium 40 was measured to be 39.9687 my uh, atomic mass units I want to calculate the mass defect in kilograms, and I also want to calculate the binding energy in mega electron volts. Now, to calculate the mass defect, I need two things. I need the actual mass, and I need, need the theoretical mass. So it's telling us here what the actual mass is. So the actual mass, M actual, would be equal to 39.9. 6, 8, 7 atomic mass units. The theoretical mass, so we'll say M theoretical, well, let's take what you know about potassium-40. Okay, so potassium-40 uh, would have 40 nucleons. Potassium, the element, if you look at the periodic table, potassium has an atomic mass number or atomic number of, where is it on here? It's 19. Okay, so it has 19 protons. If you have 40 nucleons and 19 protons, how many neutrons do you have? 40 minus 19 would be 21 neutrons. Okay, so to figure out the theoretical mass, what we're going to do is we're going to take the number of protons, which is 19, and we're going to multiply by the atomic mass unit uh, for like the mass of a proton in atomic mass units. So I believe that was the smaller one. That was like 1.007276 atomic mass units. Okay, and then we're going to add the number of neutrons and multiply by the mass of a neutron in atomic mass units. That would be 1.008665. And then let's abbreviate these. So we'll say M actual is MA, and we'll say M theoretical is MT. 
So this would give me a value that is 40.32.02.09 atomic mass units. Okay, so your theoretical mass is always going to be a little bit larger than what the actual one is. Okay, so let's figure out what the mass defect is now. So the mass defect, this is part A. Your mass defect is going to be the difference between your theoretical mass and your actual mass. So that would be equal to your theoretical one <clears throat> is 40.32002. Zero, nine. Subtract the actual mass, which is 39.9687. And this is going to give me my mass defect in atomic mass units. That would then be 0 0.3500. Five zero nine atomic mass units. Now, I don't want the mass defect in atomic mass units. I want it in kilograms, so we'll convert it. So, what do we know? We know an atomic mass, one atomic mass unit, I have 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. We're just going to use the, the value off of the formula sheet. Okay, so 1.66, 10 to the negative 27 kilograms and one atomic mass unit. So I'll cancel the atomic mass units off and that's gonna give me a mass defect. We're gonna to go to three significant digits now because of the value we're using for the atomic mass unit conversion. And that's going to give me, so we'll do 5.84 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms. Okay, so small mass defect. Now, once again, why is there a mass defect? Well, because we need to take some of that mass away to give us the binding energy to hold our nucleus together so it doesn't explode. Okay, so how do we calculate that binding energy? Well, use Einstein's mass energy equivalence theory. So that tells me that delta E is equal to delta mc squared. Let's plug the numbers in. So the mass defect is 5.84 times 10 to the negative 28 kilograms. Multiply by, and again, the c squared is this conversion factor between uh, energy and mass. So multiply by 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, all squared. And then this would give us delta E is equal to, I'm just going to quickly calculate it. So you got 5.84, 10 to the negative 28, multiply by 3, 10 to the 8, all squared. Okay, now I get a value that's 5.256. Times 10 to the negative 11. And that's going to be in joules because you're going kilograms times meters square per second squared. But it does want the answer in mega electron volts. So we're going to multiply this now by, I know in one mega electron volt, you have 1.60 times 10 to the negative 13 joules. Okay, the joules cancel off. And this would give me delta E would then be equal to, so let's take that number and divide by 1.6, 10 to the negative 19, and then no, 10 to the 13. And we should get a value that's typically like 329 mega electron volts. Okay, so that's how much energy we are required to hold that potassium-40 nucleus together. It would also be the amount of energy required to remove a nucleon from that nucleus. 
Okay, so that's it for this lesson. You can complete the assignment that's called nuclear physics. And then the next lesson, we're gonna to start to talk about more specific types of nuclear reactions. And we'll do that by getting into discussion of nuclear fission and nuclear fusion. And I'll talk to you there.